welcome to the synthesis of yoga podcast series we are on the 15th episode the third chapter 13th paragraph please ensure that you have the book with you so that you can follow these lines of sri aurobindo as we dive deeper into the line phrase by phrase enjoying or the nuances of the rich meaning that he is bringing in and this very act of this reading his lines that itself is a rich reward in terms of coming in touch with his consciousness as well as getting an imprint of his vision the way he looks at the whole yogic development and what's unfolding on earth so let's now move on and before i get into this today's paragraphs that is 13th paragraph we are starting let's just briefly retouch upon the previous episode where we looked at the conservative nature of the material man bodily life and how the progressive mind makes it moderately progressive similarly the spiritual impulse can also make it moderately spiritual but both are insufficient particularly to deal with the resistance of material nature and they don't necessarily work together and it is important that these two higher aspects needs to come together then only the lifting up of the material man can be successfully done that large scale transformation requires an active understanding and collaboration of the progressive mind and the spiritual impulse this spirit those who realized or moving towards the realization of the spiritual dimension of life needs to also embrace the progressive mind the same way progressive mind needs to embrace the spiritual dimension together the lifting up of the material life and perfecting of it will be possible now let's move on to the 13th paragraph the mental life concentrates on the aesthetic the ethical and the intellectual activities here now he is elaborating on the progressive mind the mental life concentrates on the aesthetic the ethical and intellectual activities so when the mind gets refined when it is able to go beyond the material necessities of life it will move more and more towards an aesthetic exploration where arts become its way of refining and entering into the subtler and subtler dimensions so is the notion of ethics the meaning and the right course of action the right thing to do in whatever be the context all that will become more and more important and the intellectual activities of the mind these are three very three domains the aesthetic the ethical and intellectual activities so the mental life concentrates on these things essential mentality is idealistic and a seeker after perfection remember sri aurobindo already was pointing at the fundamental uh instincts of the mind it is to move towards perfection and this progress perfectibility and sense of progress moving progressively towards perfection this is very innate inherent <clears throat> aspect of the mind the subtle self the brilliant atman is ever a dreamer the subtle self the brilliant atman here shri aurobindo is referring to 
the Mandukya Upanishad, a line from the Mandukya Upanishad where it says, who dwells in dream, the inlike conscious, the enjoyer of abstractions, the brilliant. That's how this essential mental being who is not our outer being, which is composed of these two layers, as Sri Aurobindo explained in one of the previous chapter, the sthula sharira composed of annamaya and pranamaya, and behind is the sukshma sharira, that is the self corresponding to the dream state, it's also referred to as the dream self. It's also a dreamer, the subtle self, the brilliant Atman, is ever a dreamer. A dream of perfect beauty, perfect conduct, perfect truth. These are the never-ending search of the idealist. A dream of perfect beauty, perfect conduct, individual conduct, social conduct, perfecting a society that is beautiful in its conduct. And that's where the culture come into the picture, arts and refinement of culture, all that come in there. A dream of perfect beauty, perfect conduct, perfect truth. And mind is searching for the perfect truth, most complete truth. That's its very instinct. Whether seeking new forms of the eternal or revitalizing the old is the very soul of pure mentality. So a dream of perfect beauty, perfect conduct, perfect truth, whether seeking new forms of the eternal or revitalizing the old. These are the two types of work mind takes up. One is to find the new forms of the timeless, the eternal. Other is revitalizing the old, both activities. It's search for this perfect beauty, perfect conduct, perfect truth. And that's a very soul of pure mentality. But it knows not how to deal with the resistance of matter. This is the major challenge, the progressive mind, the dreamer in us, the idealist in us, with wonderful philosophies and ethics and worldviews would come up with, but it cannot successfully deal with the resistance of matter and the conservative inertia that comes from that. So society remains in that conservative inertia, even when this progressive mind it is idealistic tendencies able to imprint that moderate progressive mindset. There it is hampered and inefficient. Works by bungling experiments and has either to withdraw from the struggle or submit to the grey actuality. And this is one of the painful and bitter experience of the idealists who try to lift up the society, struggle with it and succumb eventually. There it is hampered and inefficient, works by bungling experiments. It will experiment with the society and has either to withdraw from struggle or submit to the grey actuality, the grey actuality, the Conservative society continues in its old grooves, repeating its conservative nature. That is the grey actuality. So revolutionaries, idealists, they all come, create a wave, things will fall back after a while. That's the very nature of that struggle. And the mind progressive mind is really not capable of dealing with this resistance. It knows not how to deal with the resistance of matter. There it is hampered and inefficient, works by bungling experiments and has either to withdraw from the struggle or submit to the grey actuality or else by studying the material life 
and accepting the conditions of the contest, it may succeed, but only in imposing temporarily some artificial system which infinite nature either renders and casts aside or disfigures out of recognition or by withdrawing her assent leaves as the corpse of a dead ideal. And this is what happens to many, many ideals that come and go. Take for example, communism that emerged in the last century and established itself in large part of the world. The ideal of a society where there is equality and harmony, all that was the dream of the idealist where eventually even the government is supposed to dissolve in the world where everyone is equal, everyone receives what they need and they contribute to the society according to their capacity. Wonderful ideas, but they fall back. So, by studying the material life and accepting the conditions of the contest, it may succeed, like as I was referring to the communism, that succeeded for a while, but only in imposing temporarily some artificial system. So in order to do that, it created its artificial system of the state control over things and a mechanical process that runs the entire country. So imposing temporarily some artificial system which infinite nature either renders and cast aside. So the nature's impulsion, we can see rendering that formations aside or it disfigures out of recognition, it put it aside by withdrawing her consent and leaves as the corpse of a dead ideal. Like on one hand, we have capitalist system, for example, prioritizing the freedom of the individual. On the other side, there was this communist system that tried to bring in the equality. And in both sides, we see the failure. Communist system failed as it denied the freedom of the individual. For the sake of equality, it became uniformity, the diversity failed, and the innate instinct of the individual to be free, and that impulsion is not particular individual's impulsion, it is nature's impulsion. When that is blocked, then this larger movement, nature withdraws her consent because it is not yet applied in the right way. One cannot deny the freedom of the individual in order to accomplish the equality in a society. Ideal is wonderful, but the means also must be the right means used. On the other hand, we see capitalism maximizing the individual liberty, but collectivity has extensive inequalities. Plus, a mindless exploitation of the natural resources and destruction of nature. And the individual pursuit of freedom becomes selfish and self-centered and destructive. So both are, now nature is withdrawing her consent because eventually it will destroy the very work that she is doing. So, or else by studying the material life and accepting the conditions of the contest, it may succeed, but only in imposing temporarily some artificial system, which infinite nature either renders and casts aside, rents and casts aside, or disfigures out of recognition, or by withdrawing her assent, leaves as the corpse of a dead idea. Few and far between have been those realizations of the dreamer in man, which the world has gladly accepted. Look back to it 
a fond memory and seeks in its elements to cherish. Even the very ancient Greek memories where aesthetic culture flourished with an intellectual refinement flourished for a short period of time. And these are like memories that are very preciously looked back upon. So the few and far between have been those realizations of the dreamer in man, which the world has gladly accepted, looks back to it a fond memory and seeks in its elements to cherish. When the gulf between actual life and the temperament of the thinker is too great, we see as the result a sort of withdrawing of the mind from life in order to act with a greater freedom in its own sphere. This is a typical response of this idealist. When the gulf between actual life and the temperament of the thinker is too great, there is a reality of life around, then there is the temperament of the thinker and the idealism of the thinker when this gap is too big. We see, we see as the result a sort of withdrawal of the mind from life in order to act with a greater freedom in its own sphere. You withdraw from life to live in the world of mind, its ideas, its wonderful imaginations. The poet living among his brilliant visions, the artist absorbed in his art, the philosopher thinking out the problems of the intellect in his solitary chamber, the scientist, the scholar, caring only for their studies and their experiments, where often in former days are even now not unoften the sannyasins of the intellect. The sannyasins of the intellect. What a beautiful phrase, the sannyasins of the intellect. One who is finding that life is too challenging and you are not effective there, but you are really effective in the world of mind and thoughts and ideas, idealism. So the poet living among his brilliant visions. So we have wonderful poets writing about an ideal world. The artist absorbed in his art, fine expressions of the art and beauty. The philosopher thinking out the problems of the intellect. In his solitary chamber, the scientist, the scholar, caring only for their studies and their experiments. In search of truth, finer and more complete truth. Where often in former days are even now not and often the sannyasins of the intellect. So even in the mind field, the progressive mind in that sphere itself, there are these sannyasins of the intellect who absorb themselves in this inner pursuit. To the work they have done for humanity, all its past bears record. So these great sannyasins of the intellect and their labor in the quarries of the mind to find greater truths that can eventually transform the society. These are the landmarks that we can see many, many, many scientists and researchers and poets and philosophers leaving behind their tremendous creative work, which may not have found its application during their time, but they laid some or other stone on the way of evolutionary progression of our collective life. They are the sannyasins of the intellect who can live alone in their ivory tower, in their research pursuit. In that isolation, they discover deeper truths of the mind, more comprehensive understanding. 
and down the line, later we may discover their great work and when the time is ready, society will make use of it. Meanwhile, when they are pioneering it, hardly anyone may know what they are doing. But they do it because their love for the society and to find the deepest truth, deepest perfect form, all that they pursue, they give it expression in their writings, in their poetry, in their art, in their literature, in their philosophy and experiments to the work they have done for humanity, all its past bears record. But such seclusion is justified only by some special activity. Mind finds fully its force and action only when it casts itself upon life and accepts equally its possibilities and its resistances as the means of a greater self-perfection. One thing is to have wonderful ideas. Mind can dwell in the world of ideas and refine the ideas, go deeper and deeper and finer and finer nuances. But only when it casts itself upon life, when this idea is turned towards life for its application, when it casts itself upon life, and accepts equally its possibilities and its resistances, the possibilities of life. What is possible in the given social context and its life? And what are the resistances? When these ideas are brought in contact with the life, its resistances, its possibilities, as a means to test the idea and perfect it towards greater, perfection. So as the means of a greater self-perfection. So it is in that context the mind finds its full force and action. Now we can see this already getting applied at the larger and larger scales in the way organizations learn to take up ideas, test ideas early on, like fail fast method or the iterative development of work where you come up with the idea, you test it as early as possible without before perfecting the idea. You just go ahead, test out with a small sample. That's an example of mind taking on an idea, jumping straight into life, testing it out. In the process, it gains force and action gains traction, understand this works, that doesn't work. And so dealing with the possibilities of life as well as its resistances, understanding it, that will give greater force and action for the mind in its journey towards greater self-perfection, greater mastery over life. So coming back to the line, mind finds fully its force and action only when it casts itself upon life and accepts equally its possibilities and its resistances as a means of a greater self-perfection. All those who are successful in building up their enterprises and putting their ideas out into action, those who are dreaming of social transformation, social entrepreneurs, they take on an idea, an idea that can solve a social problem, test it out early on, and build down it, and this has become a modern trend where you don't go on dwelling on ideas to perfect it to the last detail. Jump into life, jump into action. That's where it is tested, not just tested, it will emerge stronger because you have a better understanding of life, its resistances, its possibilities, its limitations. So in the struggle with the difficulties of the material world, the ethical development of the individual is firmly shaped and the great schools of conduct are formed by contact with the facts of life, art attains to vitality. 
though thought assures its abstractions, the generalizations of the philosopher base themselves on a stable foundation of science and experience. So for this idealist mind, the progressive mind, when it really deals with the difficulties of life and the material world, that's where the ethical development of the individual is firmly shaped and the great schools of conduct are formed. So field tested, where knowledge is tested and validated and you know this works and this doesn't work. And the same way art attains to its vitality. Is the art able to influence people and change behavior, refine life? For that art must become a collectively received, celebrated movement. So when the art come in touch with life, art gains its vitality. Otherwise, art remains an isolated perfection, which hardly touch the real life of people. So we see great artists creating like wonderful movies that are of profound meaning and depth, becoming a mass movement, touching the hearts of the people. To the contact with the facts of life, art attains to vitality. Thought assures its abstractions. The generalizations of the philosopher base themselves on stable foundations of science and experience. So on one hand, science is building up detailed understanding of the material processes. And philosopher brings in the philosophical frameworks. Artists bringing in the art. Idealists bringing in the ideas. Taking concepts, applying it in life, testing it out. That's where, that's where it is really gaining traction. In that struggle, it builds itself up. In the struggle with the difficulties of the material world, the ethical development of the individual is firmly shaped and the great schools of conduct are formed. By the contact with facts of life, art attains to vitality, thought assures its abstractions. The generalizations of the philosopher base themselves on a stable foundations of science and experience. This mixing with life may, however, be pursued for the sake of the individual mind and with an entire indifference to the forms of the material existence or the uplifting of the race. Even in that mixing, it is possible. This mixing with life may, however, be pursued for the sake of the individual mind. You may still pursue this perfecting of your idea ideal for the sake of the individual mind and with an entire indifference to the forms of the material existence or the uplifting of the race. That's where you may still exclude yourself into smaller groups, leaving aside the larger collective life and small areas where you test perfect these ideas but you do not consider applying it at a wider scale. This indifference is seen at its highest in the Epicurean discipline and is not entirely absent from the Stoic. And even altruism does the work of compassion more often for its own sake than for the sake of the world it helps. So one can do this Engaging with life only for the sake of its own idea of perfection, becoming an altruist, or here Sri Aurobindo refers to Epicurean discipline or the Stoics. The Epicureans and Stoics, they were, they are from the ancient Greece, two different schools of philosophy, perfecting their ideal, living in their isolated communities, 
This indifference is seen at its highest in the Epicurean discipline. Epicureans were the 4th century uh, BCE and then there is the Stoics. They are from the 3rd century BC. So they were all such attempts. This indifference. You can grow into small philosophical schools perfecting its world in its own ivory tower perfection of the mind with, within that small circle of people in small community. Leaving aside the larger mass that is around untouched by this heights they may accomplish in their pursuit. This indifference is seen at its highest in the Epicurean discipline and is not entirely absent from the Stoic. And even altruism does the work of compassion more often for its own sake than for the sake of the world it helps. Practicing compassion for the sake of compassion for its own, one's own sense of altruism, not necessarily truly born out of the love for the world and embracing the world in order to really transform the world, but for the sake of one's own development, personal refinement, and one can do that as well. That possibility is there, but it's a very limited approach. The progressive mind is seen at its noblest when it strives to elevate the whole race to its own level, whether by sowing broadcast the image of its own thought and fulfillment or by changing the material life of the race into fresh forms, religious, intellectual, social or political, intended to represent more nearly the ideal of truth, beauty, justice, righteousness, with which the man's soul is illumined. So the progressive mind is seen at its noblest when it strives to elevate the whole race. That is where the nobility of the soul become visible because you are no more concerned about a tiny little group but it is for the larger race and lifting up the race when it strives to elevate the whole race to its own level now how does it raise it to its own level whether by sowing broadcast the image of its own thought and fulfillment by planting these ideas seeding these ideas into collective mind, the vision of greater truth it has found, seeding that, sowing that into the broader collective life. By sowing broadcast the image of its own thought and fulfillment, or by changing the material life of the race into fresh forms. Fresh forms, religious, intellectual, social or political, creating new religions or creating new intellectual movements, creating social movements, political movements. These are the ways the idealist would embrace the larger life that is around. Intended to represent more nearly that ideal of truth, beauty, justice, righteousness. These are the ideals the progressive mind would seek in its journey. Truth, beauty, justice, righteousness, with which man's own soul is illumined. That's the journey. This turning back upon life, embracing it and trying to lift the whole race. Failure in such a field matters little. For the mere attempt is dynamic and creative. Even when you fail, doesn't really matter. The mere attempt is dynamic and creative because that very effort is leaving its imprint in the collective. The struggle of mind to elevate life is the promise and condition of the conquest of life by that which is higher 
even than mind. There is that which is higher than mind, the spiritual power. That has not yet come. But very effort of the mind to struggle with the life and perfect life is a necessary step on the way. The struggle of the mind to elevate life is the promise and condition because it's a necessary condition. The progressive mind must embrace the life and transfigure it, reshape it. That's a condition of the conquest of life by that which is higher than even mind. It is only when the mind is embracing the totality of life and the life of the race. It is when that happens, then the spiritual can enter into it, work successfully. Without mind engaging with the life and its totality, spirit cannot do much. This is a condition. So the struggle of the mind to elevate life is the promise and condition of the conquest of life by that which is higher even than mind. Remember, Sri Aurobindo was referring to the need for these two stages, these two folds of life to come together. The progressive mind and the spiritual impulse. Both needs to come together and work together to lift up the race. And for the spiritual impulse to be effective, mind must embrace life in its totality, struggle with it instead of withdrawing from it, in it into its ivory tower. So when the mind turns upon life, its difficulties, its challenges, then it gains its strength, its vitality. Art gains its vitality. Philosopher makes its philosophy more effective, grounded. Science and its discoveries become more and more applicable to life. So in that condition, the spiritual impulsion can enter. <clears throat> and embrace the complexity of life to transform it from the ground up. So we can see in the world, this work is rapidly happening across the world. There is a churning of the world happening. The progressive mind brought in by science through its technologies is embracing life globally. And entire humanity is brought to its orbit. Its churning is happening. It is the condition, necessary condition for a spiritual impulse to be effective in transforming humanity. So we see this big picture. Everything has its place. The threefold life where the material life with its conservative instinct, self-protective instinct and that traditional frameworks, the inertia to change, all that needs to be changed by progressive mind and under that condition, the spiritual impulse can work. So with that, we are coming to this episode. The next episode will be coming on next Wednesday, 6 a.m. Looking forward to receive your feedback, suggestions, and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you. See you next Wednesday.